this article somewhat relates, or I don't know if it relates, but it's on the same topic of some of the things that you've discussed, so I want to throw this in. Um, this is an article that says, and it's from a, an online website, so you can comment if you know anything about it. A new groundbreaking study led by researchers at the University of Helsinki Institute of Biotechnology in Finland recently published findings in the Journal of Movement that the gut microbiology of Parkinson's patients is significantly correlated with disease progression. Compared to the control group of relatively healthy persons, those with Parkinson's have vastly different gut bacteria. This is yet another important study that contributes to the not to be ignored notion that when the bacteria in our gut are not well or thriving harmoniously, the stage is set for disease. The takeaway message I cannot stress enough to my patients is securing gut health at an early age to help create a more protected epigenetic landscape. Now that this discovery has been made, researchers endeavor to understand how paying closer attention to gut microbiology in younger patients potentially predisposed to Parkinson's may play a crucial role in eventually helping to prevent disease from manifesting. Um, continuing on later, it says, lead researcher neurologist Dr. Flip Shepherdjans noted, our most important observation was that patients with Parkinson's have much less bacteria from the prevotelexaic family, unlike the control group, practically no one in the patient group had a large quantity of bacteria from this family. While researchers have not been pinned down why this is the case, they are following study participants to discover if gut microbiology changes and if potential changes can lead to improved prognosis. Any thoughts on that? Any? <clears throat> well, we're at that stage now where there's been a great awakening uh, that the bacteria are outnumber us, they've been with us forever. Some of them have become embedded in various body parts and actually become organelles uh, within us. Um, so you, we're entering that stage where everybody's going to be looking at every condition and looking at the normal versus the abnormal and what the dominant uh, bacterial species are. And then from that, they're going to do randomized control trials where they change the bacterial species. Uh, and you can get uh, laboratory animals that are sterile, that have no bacteria in the gut, and you can then populate one kind or another kind and see what difference uh, that makes. We talked about some of that earlier today. So I think whatever our passion is, our interest is, we need to watch this research now very carefully because it's gonna come very fast and furious. Uh, these studies are, are not long as long-term as some other ones and uh, we will learn very quickly. I, I noticed in Crohn's disease patients that some of them would, well, how many people know what Crohn's disease is? Quite a few, okay. So it's an autoimmune disease of the gut where the immune system is undergoing friendly fire against the lining of the gut because somehow uh, the gut lining cells have gotten fingerprinted by the immune system and, and now are under attack. And so these Crohn's patients would be going along doing just fine and they'd get a course of antibiotics for something and their disease would flare. And then in eight weeks or 10 weeks or so, they would gradually settle back down. There'd be other people who are going along smoldering, hard to control, not doing very well, and they'd get a course of antibiotics for something else. And their disease would go into remission for eight weeks. And so that tells us that in the person who flared with antibiotics when they were well, the antibiotics were killing off something that was important to keeping whatever the immune system was riled up about under, under wraps. And the person who's sick and you kill off the bacteria that the immune system is riled up about and they go into remission. And so it takes, uh, and I made this observation, I, I, I don't know any study that I can quote about it, but it taught me that the bacteria that are there, are, what's important to one person or is a problem is not necessarily what's for the other person, even though all of it is about having the right bacteria and the immune system that's tolerant and has learned what to tolerate. So um, we're going to be looking at the changes that cause uh, Alzheimer's and the changes that cause Parkinson's. If you go to, I, I showed you some video clips from from Dr. Michael Grieger, and that was nutritionfacts.org. And he has 1,800 three-minute videos in his archives that are turning science ready for prime time into 
lay language with academic references. If you go there and you look up Parkinson's disease, there will be 10 or 15 video clips summarizing everything from food to bacteria to herbal supplements and, and beha other behavior things. And so um, this is going to be very important. There's, there's uh, people that have a tendency toward diarrhea all the time. And uh, there, we now know that there are bacteria that promote rapid uh, motility in the intestine. And there are people that don't go for three weeks at a time. And we know that there are bacteria that slow down uh, motility. So this is, this is a frontier. This is brand new stuff that will re require that we rethink everything. You said you have to rethink one thing? Yeah, that's for tonight. <laughs> Tomorrow it's a new list. Uh, so all I can say is stay tuned. We are all wide-eyed and alert about the role of the microbiome in everything. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, one of the perspectives that I sort of gathered as an outsider looking into the microbiome world and the medical world and its applications um, was that I think in many ways we're kind of in that area in the place that uh, ecology and natural history was sometime between the time of Linnaeus and Darwin in the sense that we're starting to put together the names and the ideas of maybe some of the key players, but we really don't know that much about their ecological interactions. And if we think about the human digestive tract as a series of ecosystems that are inhabited by a multitude of species, an incredible diversity of species, how is it that they interact with each other? Which are the key players? How do they change contextually? If some disappear, does that make others behave differently? What are the sort of the, the situational context in which the same microbe may play different roles depending on who it's sharing space with? Mm -hmm. We know that matters in terms of macroscopic ecology. And we also know, like, what would we know about the ecology of Australia if all we knew about was koalas? You know, we'd have a very limited view, and yet with, with the microbial world, the culturable world of microbes is what, like 1% or something of maybe of what's there? That's probably not all that off my koala in Australia analogy. Um, and so I, I think you're right that we're basically going to have to, or maybe not me since I'm a geologist, <laughs> I won't have to be rethinking this, but the people actively engaged in that kind of research I think are going to be moving into thinking about ecological interactions among organisms that are very difficult to study. And so it's going to be very interesting to see what comes together in terms of sorting through causal and associative connections um, with connecting microbial influences on particular um, diseases. I think a lot of progress has been made, and the, but the thing that gives me some, well, the thing I was really impressed by in putting the hidden half of nature together with Anne was how clear the message of some of the most effective preventative things that we can do, the kind of things around a plant-based diet that we were all sort of talking about over the last um, few days. Um, we don't necessarily have to understand all the ecological interactions between all the players to start thinking about, well, what are some smart ways to reform practices? And we could still learn a lot more as we go. I think next 20, 30 years, it'll probably take a while. Um, even with the fast and furious pace of that research today, to really figure out all the connections um, viewed through the lens of microbial ecology rather than germ theory.